How are you doing, son? Doing you know, well, right? Pastor. Doing well. What about you? I'm doing the best I can for an old man. Thank for the Lord in terms of what they are. Pastor, um, the doctors called uh, McIntyre's family in. Um, he's um, not, he's no longer conscious and um, he's laboring to breathe. They expect him to uh, pass away soon. Say it again. The doctors called Reverend McIntyre's family in today. Okay, okay. Uh, they said that he's um, laboring to breathe and he's unconscious. They don't think he's going to make it much longer. Okay. All right, all right. We're going to continue to pray for Mike, but he's looking kind of thin left when you showed it to me. Yeah, he has a DNR, a do not resuscitate. So um, uh, I spent some time with his um, oldest sister, Agnes, uh, on the phone today. And um, all we can do is honor his wishes. Okay. All right. Keep me abreast what's going on. Yes, sir. And give us the one more selection, then we're going to move. Yes, sir. Here we go.
Brother Stanley, to the family, just in case you did not hear, let's keep McIntyre family in prayer for Brother Mac. Not that God would change his will, but that God's will will be done. Amen. I want to, uh, for our um, scripture reading, is to read our uh, devotional reading for it ties, it connects the two scriptures together, really chapters 8, 9, I mean 9, 10, and 11, but chapters 10 for our uh, devotional reading, our scripture reading is Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 14. Matthew's chapter 10, uh, vindicating wisdom, upholding wisdom. And when the disciples called him, and when he had called unto him his disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases. Now the name of the twelve of the possible of these, first Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphidia, and Lebius, whose surname is Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas, his carrot, who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and in the city of the Samaritan, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead, cast out devils, free you have received, free to give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your personal script for your journey, neither two coats, neither two shoes, yet nor yet stay, for the workman is worthy of his heart. And into whosoever house it, but unto whosoever city, town is you enter in, not worthy, and there abideth there, you shall go there. And when you come into the house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it not be worthy, let not your peace, let your peace return unto you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your word, when you depart out of the house of the city, shake off the dust of your feet. And let me do verse 15. And verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in that day of judgment than of that city. Let's pray. Lord God, as we come tonight with bowed heads and humble hearts, we come thanking and praising your holy and eternal name for the many, many blessings of which you've already bestowed upon us for life, for health, for strength, and for this another day that we can give your name praises. We love you. We praise and adore your holy and eternal name. Thank you now for the new inspiration church family. And we ask now your blessings upon the McIntyre family. And they continue to give strength that they may know that you are God of truth and love and you always do that which is right. Thank you now for another day. Bless me that I might become a blessing as you bless me. I will be careful to give your name the praises. 
It is in Jesus' name and for his namesake we pray. Amen. Amen. Our lesson topic today, overall topic, is vindicating wisdom. We have been dealing with wisdom, wisdom. And the book says to us, if any man lacketh wisdom, in the book of James, let him ask of God who give it liberally and upbraid it not. Wisdom, wisdom. And Proverbs tells us uh, about wisdom, that when we, get, we receive wisdom, we see what God has given for us to do. And it's, we need to pray to the Lord to teach us uh, wisdom and understanding that we might be able to rightly divide uh, the word of truth, wisdom, wisdom. I also wanted to just bring up, if you would, a part of our introduction of our lesson contents today that deal with the Gospel of Matthew is one of the four books of the New Testament which tell the story of Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection from the dead. Through Jesus, God has restored his rule over his world, sitting right with human rebellions and has made wrong. Matthew put special force, focus on the surprise and the way in which God fulfilled his promise to Israel in Jesus. For instance, we might expect God's true king to be warmly received, but in fact, Jesus was met with hostility from his infancy. You see in Matthew chapter two, after the wise men came seeking him that was born king of the Jews, Herod told them to go find them, but immediately thereafter, when they didn't come, he, the Lord warned Joseph to take the family and go into Egypt where they could be safe. Jesus warned his disciples that they too would meet with similar opposition in chapters 10, verses 24 to 25. The same hostility is seen in the arrest and death of Jesus, of, of John the Baptist in John 14, where Herod, after Jesus foretold the fact that he was not, it was wrong for him to have his brother's wife, he did not like, like folk don't like today, another person I know today to be told the truth, and he did all that he could to destroy him. As he's awaiting in jail, he hears about what Jesus is saying and doing. He sends his disciples to ask to him, or is he the one to come or should they look for another? Jesus simply just told him, you, the sick is being healed, the blind is being seen, the dead is being raised, and most of all, the gospel is being preached to the poor. This is one of the things that uh, about wisdom, what it does it, uh, when we're going to indicate wisdom. Now, also, I wanted to, for our lesson text, because we begin at verse 7. And if you don't go back and read verse 1 through 7, you're going to miss what the author is trying to get us to understand, because most of us, our reading is kind of shallow. Uh, so let's just for... That's right, Stan. I didn't. I just said I read it. It's kind of shallow. <laughs> I've said this to us many times. You cannot, unless you are an awful good student of the Bible, begin at what the members, at what the text open up without without not reading the background to get an understanding of what the text is saying. And many times we will will kind of throw ourselves off because we feel to do what the Lord says and all that getting, get an understanding. It's important for us to get an understanding. Now, as I said to us, chapters uh, 9, 10, and 11 is kind of hooked up, and you really kind of kind of move back, even if you didn't go back no further than uh, verse 40 of chapters 10 before you go to chapter 11 and try to read through verses 7 to try to understand a little bit of what the Lord has said. Let me just do that for us. Uh, Jesus uh, is 
is speaking, and we believe them is written in the word of the Lord. He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth not me receiveth not him that sent me. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receive a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man reward. And whosoever shall give unto, and whosoever give drink unto one of these little ones, a cup of cold water, only in the name of the disciple, shall I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. And you can see the coordinate in conjunction here, which really, you see this is being hooked on together, coordinate and junction, and, and it came to pass when Jesus had made the end of his commandment in the 12 disciples, he departed then to teach and to preach in our cities. Now, when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he said to the disciples, and he said unto Jesus, or him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again, which implies doing it over again, those things which you do see or hear and see. The blind receive thy light, thy sight. The leopard walk. Excuse me, the lame walk, the lepers are healed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended of, should not be. And that's why our lesson picks up, and they departed. And they departed. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitude concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reef shaken by the wind. A reef shaken by the wind. The word they refers to John the Baptist messengers concurrent with Jesus' depart, 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 de, departure. Jesus required, Jesus speaks to the multitude regarding the attitude toward John. And attitude plays an important and practically everything you do. That's why even now and then sometimes folks say, we need to have an attitude adjustment. We have an attitude get bad towards them. We need kind of need an attitude adjustment, the attitude to Lord John. The large group likely includes those who had already considered themselves students of Jesus, others who are merely curious about his power and his, and his teaching, and still others who are skeptical or even hostile. Jesus' rhetorical question, except his audience to scoff at the idea that John had been certainly not. He is not easily shaken as a real, and whichever wind come along, John boldly told the primitive and self-satisfied that they have no standing with God unless they repent. In chapter 3 of the book of Matthew, where John stands, he's preaching and teaching, and he sees the Pharisees coming, and he says to them, O ye generation of viper, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring therefore me for repentance, for the axe is laid at the root of the tree, and if you're not right, the tree is going to be cut down, and he uses this, he uses here a rhetorical word, it's going to be cut down and thrown into the fire, which implies to us that the fire is for those who have not accepted the will of God. I don't care how well you're told, but if you have not accepted the will of God, the fire 
it's going to be for for you then but what went you out to see a man clothed in a sovereign look behold they that wear soft clothes are in the king's house kings were so clothing at that time and clothing were very important uh, and they were very expensive and everybody couldn't couldn't wear fine clothes in fact john himself he was he had a strange attirement he had uh, he was dressed in camel hair and a little girdle was about his loins but uh, his attirement had nothing on to do with his manners of, of preaching he kind of symbolized, if you would, uh, Elijah. Elijah was dressed primarily in the same manner. He had the leather girdle about him and camel hair, but he also had the courage to go before the king and let the king know what thus said the Lord in chapter one of the book of King. John's closing or anything but soft. Uh, the contrast in clothing which the people who lived in, in King how this pointed to a different lifestyle. John is like we need to be today. He was a bold spokesman. He didn't mind uh, telling people what thus says the Lord. He was bold. Uh, people are able to look past his attire and see that individual was was with a worldly agenda may try to get what they want by flattery uh, and that's going to see that in john in acts chapter 12 but they won't work with john the baptist his attire suggests that he has nothing and he wants nothing of earthly value most of us we care more about worldly stuff than we do about spiritual things. And we fail to understand that Paul had already written, or he writes later on, the love of money is the root of all evil. Most of us don't like to admit it, but we're kind of in love with money. Money is not the answer to all things. We say it is, but money is not the answer to all things. Only the word of God is the answer to all things. Have you ever found yourself in front of a fruit stand? This author said, you know how we do sometimes, checking through the fruit to see which one looks the prettiest, feeling them, picking them up to it, be, look the finest, only to get home and bite into it and find that it was not as good as we thought that it was. Many times, uh, uh, looks can be deceiving. Amen. Looks can be deceiving. So you need to go beyond looks and get to what the Lord really is saying. When you hear the gospel preach, what matters most, the outward appearance of the message or the quality of the message? It's not how you look, but it's how well you speak about him of whom you represent. Most of us spend more time trying to look good and our uh, message is kind of short. We need to get our message together and don't worry about our attire. Verse 9a says, but they went, but what went you out to see a prophet? Having exposed, observed the fictitious reason for seeking out John, Jesus began to offer the real the Baptist because they believed him to be God and or in God. Often we associate the works of prophets with, uh, with predicting the future. Certainly, the biblical prophet did speak of future events in, in Isaiah 9. But that primary works was not predicting, but 
proclaiming or proclamation. It's not all the time what you say, but how you say what you say. In chapter 19 of 2 King, and I'm going to come back to that later, later on, after Elijah had, had been, been very successful, he listened to what Jezebel was saying, and he ran off for a moment and hid himself and thought that there was nobody left but him. Sometimes we kind of think of that there's nobody left but, but God had him to know that I have 7,000 who have never bowed thy knee to Baal. So sometimes we are not only somebody that God is using, so we need to understand God still have more people that have heard and believed the word than what we do. And I'm going to come back to that a little bit later on because I need to read chapter 18 for you to understand chapter 19. Prophecy of all time was concerned with various aspects of God's promise. Having been taken captivity by the hostile nation, the Israelites heard the prophet promised that God would free them from captivity and return them to the homeland. This deliverance was to be so exceptional that it would be demonstrated to the nation that Israel God was and was the only true God. So says Isaiah chapter 2 verse 1 to 5. Because this promised act of God so closely resembled the deliverance of Israel from slavery in Egypt, the prophet could speak of its similarities. Turn an example of Isaiah. God had visited his people in that Zion, Egypt, declaring the rules of Egypt and bringing his people into the promised land. You see that in Exodus 15. Well, really 13, 14, and 15, where God finally gets him into the promised land. And then you see it again, what he would do in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 10. Yes, I say unto you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, a look I will send my messengers before your priests, which shall prepare the way before thee. That was John's job. Preparing the way of the Christ. And we read that Acts chapter in Matthew chapter 3. He says, This is what I've been telling you about. I'm not willing even to stoop down and unloose the shoes of the latches on his shoe. He, I'm, he says, I am just a messenger. Just a messenger. He is the one about whom John spoke. John, if John wrote, is to prepare the way of the Lord. And if John had indeed prepared the way of Jesus, then logically it follows that Jesus is the Lord living among his people. John announces of the nearness of God's kingdom, of the coming of God's true king in John chapter 3. Let me just go to John chapter, Matthew chapter 3, which is 1 through 3, for just a minute. See what I'm trying to say. In those days, and those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make way his path straight. John was not worried about his retirement, he was worried about his message. Getting out for the people who don't say, I say unto you, I say unto you that the prophet for it was a witness. In verses uh, 10, 11, it says, Verily, I say unto you, and this is kind of a, it's kind of sound kind of controversial. Looks like Jesus is doing some double talk, but you got to read this kind of slow to understand what he said. Verse 11. Bear I say unto you, among those that are born of a woman, there have not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Kind of sound kind of confusing, but what he really said, even though John is a great man, the one that's speaking is greater than he. He was referring 
to himself, I am really greater than John. John says to him, I'm just a voice. I'm, I'm going to introduce you to the one who really is going to be the greatest of all. In using the word verily, Jesus introduced this proclamation with the expression that affirms his trustworthiness. In Matthew 5, 18, Jesus says, turn to 5, 18 in the Beatitude. I don't want to, I want to get you to say, because I really want to read 17 and 18, 5, 17 and 18. Jesus says, think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophet. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. You got to understand again the Hebrew character, a jot and a tittle was two of the smallest characters that was in the Hebrew language. And a jot and a tittle, not one, even not one of those jots or tittle was going to pass before all that the Lord has said was going to be fulfilled. Amen. Thank the Lord for his goodness, his goodness. Uh, Jesus is challenging his audience to rethink the understanding of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus' contemporaries believe that the kingdom of God will, will be established in a, in a political way. That's not what Jesus was talking about. And you can see that in John 1, 6, when Jesus is, is, is getting ready to go home. His disciples said to him, Lord, will thou at this time show us or restore to us the kingdom of God? Jesus said, that's not your business when that's going to be, but you're going to receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost will come upon you, and then you shall be my witnesses, and without, without the Holy Spirit, maybe that's why one of us don't witness no more than we do. You need the Holy Ghost to witness. The Holy Ghost is boldness that you can declare the wisdom that God has given unto you. And most of us, we talk a good game, but few of us want to be a witness for the Lord. It takes, it takes, it takes some courage to be a witness. And one of the, as I said to us on the, in my message on the other day, what we do, we got to make ourselves available to the Lord. And when you fail to make yourself available to the Lord in your actions and your life and your living, many times we have messed up so bad that we cannot actually, uh, tell people about the Lord because they want to point fingers at us and say to us in so many words, if you can make it, live it like you're living, then I'm going to make it. But God's intentions are much broader than that his kingdom is in his promises reign over the world. In Philippians 2, uh, Jesus talks about the fact, let me just turn there, Philippians 2, Philippians 2, Philippians 2, verses 10, Philippians 2, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Verse 10. All right, somebody got it right there. Verse 10. But the verse 10. Verse 10, verse 10, verse 10. Verse 10, you got it? Verse 10, you probably got it. Verse 10. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. For by my, my love, as you have always obeyed, not as in prison only, but now much more in my absence, 
work out your own salvation with fear and trouble. Now that don't mean you can work to be saved, even though you need to work because you are saved. Can I get a witness? I don't want nobody to leave. The pastor said we need to work out our soul salvation. You work because you are saved. Amen. Amen. Jesus spoke of God's kingdom in terms of three frames, near, here, and yet to come. One more time. He spoke over three times. Near, here, and is to come. Amen. Jesus spoke of his came in three to Jesus speaks of it. But as Jesus is healed, nine hand, Jesus healed and drives out demons. He is more likely to be uh, speaking of God's kingdom is a, already present as he speaks of what his followers come to understand as he returns. He speaks of the kingdom as a future reality. It's here, it's near, and it is to come. One day, maybe that's why Paul writes later on in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, I have not seen, ear have not heard, it has not yet entered into the hearts of men, the good things that the Lord have in store for those who would follow him. For the perceptive of the kingdom is either near or future. Jesus can speak of John as less than the least in the kingdom. John is held as God's kingdom first announcement in nearness, but he is not yet a subject of the kingdom in terms of future reality. For it has not yet arrived in that sense. God has done great things to John. But God will do greater things through and for the subject of God's kingdom by the way of Jesus and the resurrection. You see in, in John 14, 12, well, back in John 11, when he comes into the neighborhood of where Maisie and Martha lived, she said to him, Lord, if you would have been here, our brother whom you love would not have died. Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live again. And then he says to us, do you believe that? Now also in John chapter 14, he says in verses 12, Verily I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the work that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. 13. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now that's in court, that's according now to what the will of God is saying in God's name. That don't mean you go out and ask the Lord to kill somebody that you don't like. That's not in the name of the Lord. Sometimes we, sometimes we get things all kind of mixed up a little bit. <laughs> That's what I saying. And you need to go back to chapter six of the book of Matthew to understand that. When he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In earth as it is in heaven, is that God's kingdom is yet to come, and His will is yet to be, to be done. Verse twelve. And from that day, John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and violence was taken by force. Jesus followed one challenge saying with, with another that even more challenging, the idea that God's kingdom can suffer violence seemed not to be real 
How could the rule of the Almighty be challenged by anyone? Jesus seemed to refer to the world's uh, treatments of citizens of God's kingdom. One example is how Herod and Antipas had already imprisoned John. As I said to us, he imprisoned John for John telling the truth. He told John, it is not, he told, he told Herod, it is not right for you to have your brother's wife. Herodias didn't like that, what he said to her. So, uh, the king makes a mistake and throws a feast. And he says to her daughter, if you, if I like what you're doing, you can ask me anything, even to half of my kingdom, I will give it to you. She danced, the girl Melissa could get down pretty good. And he was pleased. And because of his word, when he said John the Baptist here, he was sure, but because of his word, can you imagine him beheading John and bringing his head to her on a silver platter? But that was because he had to keep his word. For all the prophets and the law, for all the prophets and the law prophesied unto John. The prophecy and the law is expressed referring to Israel's scripture that Christians call the Old Testament. Jesus says that John's work was the climax of the message of the books. Jesus speaks of the Old Testament in his entirety, the story of the patriots and the nation of Israel, the law, the teaching of the prophet. They're coming together on a message, the promise. They announced the promise on, until John, who was directed by God to announce the soon be followers of the promise. And if you will receive it, this is like Elisha, which was to come. Underlining Elisha, Elisha was a great man, as I said to us earlier. Elisha, in chapter 17, uh, Ahab had became so wicked. <laughs> the Lord told him to go and tell Ahab that it was not going to rain for three years and six months, according to the word of Elisha. And then God sent him down by the brook of Kidron. There God sent the raven to feed him meat, and he had water to drink. One day, the bird didn't show up. And Elijah left and went down to Zephaniah. There he left at a, wood, at a widow's house. And every time that she would shake the bell, it would come forth. And then finally the Lord told him to show yourself to Ahab. And when he showed himself to Ahab, he said to the people of, 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 of Israel, go to get go to first king, chapter sixteen. First King chapter 16. You know the story of how he challenged, yeah, he challenged the prophet of Baal. He laughed at them and allowed them to uh, jump up and down all day. And then finally, he said to them in verses uh, 21, chapter First King chapter 16, verse 21. How long holds you between two opinions? If God be God, serve him. And the people wouldn't ask a word. That's the way we are sometimes. When we ask, we ask people about who God really is, because sometimes they don't know. They will not answer you a word about what thus says the Lord. How long? And then he goes about doing what he has to do uh, in challenging the people of God. And, and once he once he challenges the people of God, Elijah allows them to, to build our altar 
they call upon me. And he had said to them, and the God that answers by fire, let him be God. They scream, they jump, they cut themselves, they call him, and Elijah started making fun of him, said, call him a little louder, maybe he's going on, maybe he's sleeping. And then finally he told him, tear down all this stuff. Tear down all this stuff, and he built his altar. And then he asked for three barrels of, four barrels of water, he does that three times, the name of the Holy Ghost, and uh, he called on the Lord, and the Lord sent down fire and consumed the altar. And John the Baptist, did, at this particular time, is a representative issue of what Elijah the prophet has done. But he had them know that greater than Elijah was here, greater than him was here. And verse 14, and if you receive this, Jesus sometimes in the conversation with the word of one and encourages people. This says encourage hearers to think carefully about what they hear and to respond appropriately to the challenge of what is going on. But the gen this generation, this generation, this generation, this generation. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like the children and sitting in the marketplace and calling to their followers. This phase generation and expressed is like a period of Jesus' teaching. He used on those who reject his message despite their having witnessed his mighty acts of power. Though Jesus' contemporary may not re realize it, they ref thy refusal to trust God paralleled the same attitude as thy ancestors do in the Exodus. That re refusal resulted in the wilderness until all the generation died off. Because they refused to accept the Lord, the Lord allowed them to 40 years to be able to look into the promised land. And they were not able to see it because they had refused to accept what thus said the Lord. And what these people did, these young children perhaps, they said they piped unto them, which means they played music for them, but they would not dance. We have mourned unto them, but they would not cry. But the children of Israel began to began to, to wail as if feeling, but others cheering, but others cheering still did not join. Regardless of how the situation, the other children never offered the expected response. The idea seemed to be that the generation Jesus is crucified and criticizing want him to dance to that tune. We said dance to my music, but Jesus would not dance to that tune. And sometimes we think that if you got to dance, you don't dance to the tune. Ain't nothing gonna be happening. But Jesus would not dance to that tune. Neither would John the Baptist. For John the Baptist came neither eating nor drinking. And they said John the Baptist had a devil. The two actions of the cheering of the, uh, the marketplace suggest the contrast that Jesus now make. John the Baptist lived under the vows of the Nazarites. He wouldn't cut his hair. He refused to drink strong wine. Jesus came eating, drinking with them, and they said that he was a glutton uh, and a wine bibbler. And most of all, they said that he was a friend to the Pharisees and sinners. How I thank God 
for being a friend to the sinners. I don't know about you, but I am a sinner saved by the grace of God. And had not God came to be a friend to the sinners, oh Lord, I know I would be in trouble and I got a sneaky feeling that you too would be in trouble. By contrast, it is known as the banquet given to those at the mud. The tax collectors was regarded by his family Jews as being forfeited our standing before sinners when notorious in that community for violating God's law. Jesus is called a gullible, or he drank too much, and a wine blibber. For his association with such people as meal, Jesus, of course, has an explanation. He come to save just such people as, as that. That's why he came into the world. And when he gives this banquet, he sees my, he sees, he sees a Levite who later lay lame lame name later was changed to be Matthew. He went and he sat and he drank with them, for he came to be a friend to the sinner. For those unwilling to the for those unwilling, and that's those of us who are unwilling to accept the message of God. It is good enough. Note the wrong-headed criticism. Jesus, John is not too strict with himself and thus has a devil. Jesus is too indulgent, but God is at work in both, bringing his promise to the fulfillment the children of wisdom, those who respond to John and Jesus in faith, will prove will prove the truth of what those two proclaim. If we think, if we think the wisdom of God is bound to meet this universal except the New Testament tells us, the gospel has already sharply devised Jesus joyless faith and many but received but many received him powerful powerfully even violent opposition against others god's wisdom appear to some as it is addressed by deepest need but it repels others and is talented to us thank god today for the message maybe that's why paul said in Acts 1 8, the preaching of the gospel to them that perish is foolishness. I don't know about you, but before I learned how to believe in the gospel, I too thought it was just foolishness. But I'm glad I finally read this way. But unto us who are saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. How do you deal with the tension of God's kingdom, which is both now and yet to be? Circumstances can prove sometimes to discourage the time, but trusting that Christ reign now and will, will fully be in the future can provide strength and encourage to meet even the biggest challenge those included even the challenge of Herod's prison for John and the challenge for Jesus on the cross. The strength we have in Christ Jesus is the strength that will vindicate the wisdom of God. How strong? What is your determination? How well, how much do you love the wisdom of God? Do you uphold it? Do you try to understand it? Do you uphold it righteousness? For the wisdom of God, and when you read 
the book of Corinthians, the wisdom of God baffles, if you would, those who don't understand the ways of God. Let me just read this and I'm going to close. Acts, uh, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, chapter uh, 1. 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, I'm going to close. I know I've run over. 1 Corinthians, chapter 1. Verse 21, verse 20, verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribes? Where is the spirit of this world? Has not God made foolishness the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. And it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Somebody listening to my voice today have thought that it was foolishness. But by the wisdom, by the preaching by the, of God, it saves those of us who believe in the words of the Lord God Almighty. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for another day. Thank you for life. Thank you for health. Thank you for strength. Thank you for the forerunner who came into the world to present unto us him who was your son. And I can hear him saying when he goes into the water, I have need to be baptized of thee, so said Matthew 3. But Jesus says, suffer it to be so now, for thus it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him, and the scripture said, and straightway Jesus came up out of the water, and a voice was heard saying, this is my beloved son and whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Thank God for those of us who have ears to hear. Ears to hear. Let us hear what thus said the Lord. Our mission pledge. I am persuaded by the teaching of the Blessed Bible, by daily reading, meditation, and communion with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to live an upright Christian life, to practice his teaching in my dealing with my fellow man, to the other give my talents, to go with my time and influence, to the teaching of the young people, and last of all, for the spreading of the gospel to everybody everywhere. That's one of our ob obligations that we have and that we should do. And once we spread the gospel to everybody, we will be doing what the Lord has set up to us to do. Now to him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the throne of grace, to him the wise God our Father be glory, honor, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. And if you love the Lord, you ought to just wave your hand and say, Amen. God bless us. Have a smile upon us. God's wisdom, God's wisdom, the vindication of God's wisdom. Thank you again for being so kind. Bless you. Have a smile upon you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Hope that we will go back again and read it again. As I said, I know many of us don't read that much. But let's go back and read. Glad to see you, Brother Hill. I hadn't seen you for two or three times on that. Glad to see you, man. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being on today with us. Bless us. Eric Moore, glad to, see, glad to see your name up there too, boy. Glad to see you. Amen. Bless us. Bless us. Thank you so kindly. And to see all of my sweet members. 
who is on today. Thank you, thank you. Sylvia, we continue to pray for you. And as Brother Brother Mac, Brother Stan had told us about Brother Mac, let's pray. That thank you. I will be done, but that God's will will be done. Exactly. Amen. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. God bless you. Oh, yes. Let us not forget those of you who are doing it. We thank God for you. Send your gifts to Newest Racial Church, Post Office Box 3702. Uh, 78133. God bless us. Have a smile upon us. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Amen. How you get out of this? How you? Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, baby. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good week, Pastor. Thank you, baby, Miss Miss uh, Dempsey. Mr. Lewis. Hi, Sylvia. Hello there, Deacon. I'm fixing to hang up. We are. I gave you permission. <laughs>